Marie Uyol was a French poet, animal rights activist, feminist, and an early advocate for antinatalism. She was born on the 28th of June 1846 and died on the 13th of April 1930, which means today is her 94th death anniversary. Marie was a unique, interesting, and controversial character who divided people in her day, but also has a legacy that still inspires others today. She also seems to have been quite an eccentric character, which you'll probably pick up on throughout the course of the video. And the subject of this video is going to be her antinatalist views, which as we'll get into were informed by several lines of reasoning, including anti-capitalism, misanthropy, anti-militarism, but at its most fundamental, a care for the being who would be brought into existence. I'm also going to touch on her views on animal rights as well near the end of the video. So as is probably obvious, because this video is going to be focused on her antinatalist views and also on her views on animals, I'm not going to be covering all aspects of her ideas or who she was really as a person. If you'd like to get a more rounded view of who she was as a person and the other ideas she had, I've included a range of links in the description. And these include a biography of her by Sylvia Vagnon, which a disclaimer I haven't read because it's in French and only available in physical form. There's a Wikipedia page on her. There's her Les Maisels de Notre Dame de Solitude, which is a collection of her poems and more. And actually just on that, the preface to the collection of her poems is written by her friend Rachilda, who actually describes describes the time she first came into contact with Marie and also what she's like as a person. She explains that the first time she met Marie was when she came across her saving a cat from a construction worker who was about to kill the cat by hitting the construction worker over the head with a parasol. And Rashilda says, But who is this strange person? I asked the bystander next to me, left stupidly standing in front of the construction hole where nothing was transpiring anymore. It's Marie Ayou. Anyway, before getting into the video properly, I want to put two disclaimers forward. The first is that as you see in the rest of the video there were certain views and also certain actions that Marie held or took that were very controversial and ethically questionable and I'm saying this now to one let people know so that they know it's coming up but also so that people understand that these views or these actions that she took were held in tandem with her antinatalist beliefs and all of her other beliefs but not necessarily entailed by them I'm talking specifically about her pro mortalist beliefs that she seemed to hold quite strongly at least as it it pertains to animals. And of course, pro-mortalist beliefs are about the ending of lives, whereas antinatalist beliefs are concerning the starting of lives. These two beliefs are often confused by people who don't properly understand antinatalism. And I wanted to put this disclaimer in here now so that they're not confused by any of the viewers as they're listening to quotations from Marie and hearing about actions that she took. Secondly, is that all the quotations and materials and passages that you're going to hear throughout this video were all originally in French. Now, given I'm not a French speaker, I was very kindly helped by some French speakers to translate a lot of these materials and this video wouldn't have been possible without them. But having said that, I still do want to say that everything that you're going to hear from Marie or about Marie in these quotations and passages have been translated. And so this does mean that some of the original meaning may have been lost and they may have been in a context that we don't fully understand now. And actually very finally, as a little bonus third disclaimer, I do want to say that there's going to be a lot of French words words that I'm going to be trying to pronounce in this video and I am definitely not going to do them accurately so I apologize to all French speakers for the abominations that you are going to hear throughout this video. So let's get into her antinatalist beliefs. Marie believed that procreation was an immoral act and that humans would be better going extinct. Now to understand Marie's radical and multifaceted beliefs on this topic we have to understand the context that she existed within. Marie was part of what is known as the Neo-Malthusian movement. The Neo-Malthusian movement was a movement that began in France in the 1870s and advocated for denatalism or a reduction in the birth rates and the population generally. Many of you would have heard of Thomas Malthus who is famous for his theory of population that he put forward in an essay on the principle of population. Now it's not really important to dive into Malthus and his theories but what's important to know for this video is that based off of his theories he advocated for a reduction in birth rates. However Malthus had quite conservative views and so he he advocated for this reduction in birth rates through celibacy and late marriage. And what stood the French Neo-Malthusian movement apart from Malthus, putting the Neo in Neo-Malthusian, was that they were more progressive and they rejected the conservative approach to reducing birth rates and instead advocated for the use of contraception rather than the shunning of sex. Okay, but why did Neo-Malthusianism in France advocate for reduced fertility? Well, there are a few motivating ideas. Two of these were anti-capitalism and anti-military 
militarism, likely as a result of the movement primarily being made up of anarchists and socialists, but also because France had just been defeated in the Franco-Prussian War with Germany. As Fatima Ramdi explains in Impeding the Birth Control Movement, Theories and Activities in France and the United States. In France, the main plan of action of the Neo-Malthusians was to attack the capitalist regime by refusing to give birth to future proletarians exploited by the bourgeois. The French Neo-Malthusians advocated a war on the womb as to stop providing machine gun fodder. Marie Eau clearly expressed the same sentiments in an 1892 article called Maternity, which she wrote for the anarchist newspaper Le Dion. Well-deserved assistance. The Ministry of War is granted 350 francs in compensation to the widow Mrs. Vibrech, who lost seven sons in military service. Eat up, old lady, you won't die of indigestion at this price of meat and cannon fodder, unless the disgust and remorse over your spawnings makes you find this Eucharistic bread nauseating to the point of spitting it in the face of the government. Ah, when will the wretched Neo have suffered enough to abate the macabre fecundity in her hips? And when will this subjugated woman's womb, this cursed womb of females and mothers, go on strike? Commenting on this, Marie-Pierre Tadif explains in this piece, which I'm not going to try and read out because I would just completely butcher it. Marie Eau uses the imagery of cannibalism to denounce the fact that mothers continue to give birth to men who serve as cannon fodder for the state. The comparison she draws between the meat eaten by the mother and the flesh of the soldiers reveals the state as an anthropophagous monster. Not only is the state machine depicted as a cannibal that feeds on soldiers to survive, but it also turns the mother into a cash cow that it feeds and exploits. And Jill Richards develops this commentary in The Fury Archives, Female Citizenship, Human Rights and the International Avant-Garde. Uyo made famous a conceptual analogy that would migrate into loftier political circles on the international extreme left over the next four decades. In this analogy, the production of people to fight in wars is likened to the industrial production of commodities. Through the birth strike, women might call the production of people to a halt and therefore occupy occupy a position of bargaining power in the nation state, potentially stalling the expansion of capitalist enterprise more widely. What's also worth noting that in this article, Maternity, Marie sowed the scenes for what is perhaps her most persisting antinatalist legacy. In this article, Marie coins the term birth strike, or what is maybe a more accurate translation from French is strike of the wombs, or strike of the bellies. This phrase went on to inspire people at the time, like Fernand Colony in 1908, who published a piece of literature using the same name, but it's also been used as a general term to describe Neo-Malthusianism from that whole period such as Francis Ronsin's belly strike, Neo-Malthusianism and the drop in French birth rates in the 19th and 20th century. The term even inspired the name of the birth strike movement, which still exists today. But anyway, going back to Marie. Her opposition to reproduction was also born from her feminist views. As she views non-reproduction as a form of revolting against the military by not producing more cannon fodder, soldiers to die in war, and also against capitalists by not producing more wage slaves, she also thought non-reproduction was a means of empowering women. It meant kicking back against the traditional conception of what makes a woman and also freeing her from the burden of pregnancy and raising a child. And this is something she speaks in more detail about in a contribution she makes to the booklet Le Neomathusme et le Moral, which I'll mention later in the video. While she clearly shared the anti-militaristic, anti-capitalist and feminist values of the wider Neomathusian movement, she wasn't defined by the movement. As Francis Ronsin explained, it was was a woman, Marie Eau, who first made available antinatalist ideas to a large number of people. In reality, the radicalism of Marie Eau's thoughts is far away from Malthus's philosophy and has only a distant connection with Neo-Malthusianism. Marie's antinatalist views went far beyond Neo-Malthusianism and extended to a rejection of humanity and existence itself, and thus she advocated for a complete cessation of reproduction, not just a reduction of it. And this distinction was even picked up on at the time by Jacques Mao in an article where he says, Madame Marie Uyo, for example, isn't Malthusian for the same goal as Malthus, nor for the religious motivations of the Scoptes. She believes that life is bad, that nature is a bad mother, and her utopia would be to achieve nothingness. Nothingness is the perfect state. And we'll get more into this article later in the video. What's also interesting is a passage from Rosanne's book where he talks about the potential inspiration for Marie's more hardline antinatalist views. Finally, a very limited body of information 
mention allows me to mention two other organizations that are also important to be linked to the Neo-Mathusian movement. A German named Koenig spreads very original propaganda throughout Europe based on what he calls neo-nihilism and the total rejection of procreation. Since 1896, he had distributed a first brochure in French, Norval Appreciat de Instinct Sexual Pessimisme Jurisprudence Psychiatra, in which he claims to be inspired by Schopenhauer's work and in particular by his chapter Metaphysics of Sexual Instinct. Koenig's efforts towards France would continue for several years. Having founded an international education consulting centre in Heilbronn, he published a new manifesto, Der Neonihilismus Antimilitarismus Sexualiben Ende die Menschen, which he distributed free of charge in a large number of copies, particularly among French teachers. As for the synthesis he makes between nihilism and the rejection of childbirth, his work has most certainly influenced some French neo-Malthusianisms, in particular Marie Eau. Now, Koenig is an important figure in antinatalist history, and I'm not going to go into him now, but if you want to learn more about Koenig, his views on antinatalism and his contributions to antinatalism, then you can watch a discussion I recently did about him on my channel. The link is in the description. Perhaps the most important moment for Marie's antinatalism was on the 2nd of October 1892. On this date, she gave a lecture at the Salle de Société de Géographie in Paris on the topic of antinatalism and other topics. As I've said before, Marie was a controversial character which meant that she attracted protesters. As reported by a newspaper at the time, Le Figaro, on the 29th of September of that year, several venues actually refused to host her lecture before she found the venue that she did in fact give it at. Marie Eau, secretary of the League Against Vivisection, has until now only protected animals. Now she is deigning to protect humans by preventing them from being born. On Sunday, she will be giving a free lecture at the Salle de Société de Géographie on the elimination of misery for humans and animals through Malthusianism. Ladies are especially invited, they will hear some funny things. Once delivered, the lecture sparked a response from many newspapers and media outlets. By 1892, when Marie gave this lecture, she'd given many lectures in the past and was relatively well known and had made a name for herself. In fact, some people saw her lectures as a bit of an annual event, but none of them before this one that I know of of contained antinatalist thoughts. At this lecture, some of the articles report that there were approximately 2,000 people in attendance, although obviously newspapers are not always the most reliable source and can sensationalize things. What we can say about the composition of the audience is that there were groups of students from the Latin Quarter, which is an area of Paris, which came to hate watch her and heckle her as she was giving her lecture, which wasn't an uncommon occurrence with her lectures. The newspaper Le Temp mentions that members from the Society for the protection of animals were probably her most favorable members of the audience. Another one mentions Charles Richet, who later went on to win a Nobel Prize, being a member of the audience, and also a town councillor. And several newspapers say that the lecture theatre was full. Now, before we dive into the response to the lecture, we've obviously got to cover the lecture itself. The only issue is that obviously there was no audio recording, and even though the lecture at the time had been written down, as we'll see reference later on, I could not find copies of that that still exist today. We do, however, have an approximate version of the lecture written down by Marie in 1909 and published under the name The Pain of Living, or in French, Le Mal de Vivre. And that was published by a group called Genre Sur Consciente, which means conscious generation in English. And they were a neo-Malthusian organization founded by Eugene Humbert, which published material advocating for lower birth rates. And it's this publication that we'll use to discuss the lecture. And it's interesting, the name of the lecture she chose, The Pain of Living is actually a play on the name of Emile Zola's novel The Joy of Living. That title itself being ironic because the novel contains a lot of witness to suffering. So it's interesting to see where Marie gets her inspiration from. So she covers a range of topics as part of the lecture including the evolution of human society, the harms that humans do to animals, and why clergymen and capitalists advocate for more procreation amongst other topics. But obviously antinatalism is a strong thing 
theme throughout the lecture. So Marie has a clear misanthropic view of humanity, which seems to be strongly informed by her observation of humans harming animals. And this misanthropic view of humanity probably plays into her advocation for humanity going extinct. Now, of course, I'm not going to read through the whole text. If you'd like to access the whole text in French, I have linked it in the description. But I'd also like to announce that La Mal de Vivre, or The Pain of Living, has now been translated into English in full, thanks to the translators that helped me with the research to this video. So I want to give a big thank you to the translators for making this work by Marie available to English speakers so that we can read her lecture in full. You can find a link to the English translation in the description of this video. So now what I'm going to do is highlight some passages where the antinatalist themes in her lecture are most strong. So let's get into it. Right at the beginning of the lecture, Marie says this, We have often been accused of being revolutionaries because we demand a share in social rights for animals. Anarchists because we do not accept that intelligence should arrogate to itself a tyrannical omnipotence over our less gifted brothers. And disruptors because we want to change the order that is as stubborn as it is unforgiving, which mercilessly hands over the weak to the whims of the strong. Well, we're this and that, and better still, we're above all nihilists. Not those timid sectarians who confine themselves to religious or political questions and only follow the doctrine up until a point, terrified by the idea of nothingness, but rebels who say to life, you will go no further. So here she's not using nihilism in the same way that we use it today. What she likely means here is someone who advocates for nothingness or against existence. And actually this term is used in a similar fashion by Koenig, and this is actually covered in my discussion with Karima Kerma and Lenny on Koenig. So I'm going to include a clip now where Lenny explains the use of this term. And it's also worth noting that Koenig uses the term nihilismus or nihilism a bit differently from um, how we are used to seeing it. Usually it means like the denial of the existence of things like moral values or, or of meaning or of truth. But for him um, it means something else. So nihilism is derived from the Latin word nihil which means nothing. And nihilismus, nihilism for him, is some sort of nothingness advocacy. So the idea that non-existence is preferable to existence, and in the context of procreation specifically, so procreative nihilism, if, if you will, means that it is better not to um, create uh, another being into existence. So, quite soon after that passage, Marie goes on to say this. Happiness does not exist for anyone because it is not in the eminence of nature. Misfortune is the common law. It is the eternal fatum that weighs on all beings, and before which we must either submit or resign. But the stupid love of life is so strong that the vast majority submit and resign themselves to suffering. Still, if man only accepted this burden for himself, he could be forgiven. But passive to the core, he cowardly obeys his enemy instinct and perpetuates the cursed heritage by giving life to beings who do not ask to be born. More often than not, he commits this homicide unconsciously and is usually punished enough by the disastrous consequences of this amount of absent-mindedness. But when he premeditates the crime, no punishment is severe enough to make him atone for it. Whatever the feelings of those who procreate, if they act knowingly, knowing that they create an organism for pain, a soul for disappointment and a harmful being, both victim and executioner, they are criminals and the child has the right to consider his father and mother as mere murderers. Yes, murderers. For who gives life gives death. This prospect should be enough to command abstention. But what then? It's the end of the world. Obviously, the world will come to an end sooner or later, and I, for one, have no problem with that. I don't even mind glimpsing into the mists of eternity and seeing the earth finally purged of its human microbes, left to the wild flora and fauna, awaiting the blessed day when it's stripped of this last instance of life. So this passage alone contains a whole range of things. She goes as far as to call those who intentionally procreate murderers, whilst recognising that most people procreate out of carelessness. She recognises that many people simply act on instinct or autopilot pilot if you will, but that people should refrain from procreating. And she even explicitly states that this will result as a consequence in extinction and she is completely fine with that. Later on she expresses her admiration for the Skotsi, a Christian sect in Russia who were known for castrating themselves to ensure there was no chance that they would reproduce. There are the Skotsi, 
they are closer to the supreme goal, annihilation. In the eyes of these sectarians, man personifies evil, which is why he must disappear. However, they do not exterminate him. They proceed to extinguish this harmful animal by an operation for which brown saccade is famous, cutting out from both sexes the diabolical organs in which race and satanism fester. I salute these ascetics enamored of sterile nirvanas. She clearly admires the lengths that the Scopsi went to to abide by their belief that we should be bringing no more humans into existence. She then goes on to be quite poetical, albeit quite graphic as well. How dare those who have just closed graves start over with cradles? Who does not recoil in horror at this cosmic circle where love and death shuttle back and forth between embryos and corpses? At this macabre nature, this lecherous gluttonous gall, disgorging generation after generation, crushing them under their own torrent and swallowing the all-consuming bitch, this vomit of feti and spectres. This passage clearly shows the disdain that Marie has for existence and that she prescribes non-reproduction as a response. Again, if you want to read the full text that is linked below in the description, but those are a few excerpts where she most prominently presents her antinatalist view. Now we'll move on to the response to the lecture, but before we do that, I want to mention something that several papers comment on, which is at the lecture, present was her husband and her son. Interestingly, she had a son, and as best as I could tell, that was in 1868, which is confirmed in this correspondence and I believe this would make her approximately 22 years old at the time and she stated that his conception was an accident. In an article in La Silhouette from the 16th of October 1892, one of the ones we'll get to, it quotes her as saying, when a man shows up the woman must shout, stop right there, we can do anything, even make mistakes, but no children. What Mrs. Marie Ayou complains about most is having had one, oh by chance in fact, by clumsiness she says. And a bit more on her son actually. His name was Henry, and it seems from the snippets that I can find that they actually had quite a good relationship, and he was supportive of her. In fact, Rashild says in the preface to that collection of her poems, her son, very young, has given and received blows while defending his mother during the infamous conferences. Marie also dedicated the first poem in that collection to her son. And the newspaper Mercure de France said about her son, nothing more beautiful than to see, in these times of general cowardice, this very young Henry Uyou, during his terrific mother's talk in the middle of a hundred students driven crazy with rage by a little bit of brutal logic and standing up to them with a chivalry that is certainly no longer in use amongst our dear country's sons. And she also collaborated with him on a play she wrote. If you want to read more about that, you can read it here in Neon Montre fall, Marie Iou. Anyway, getting back to the response. Not long after Marie had finished her lecture, in fact the next day, reviews and responses began to be published. In Le Goulois on October 3rd, the author of this article explains the atmosphere in the lecture theatre. Around 2,000 people had responded to the speaker's call, so the amphitheatre of the Société de Géographie was absolutely packed. The speaker was not spared all kinds of laughter. Unperturbed when the uproar became too violent, she would sit down with dignity to resume her somewhat personal statement of principles as soon as relative calm had returned. The day after that, on the 4th of October, at least four articles were published. In Le Temp, an article explains the opening of the lecture. Slim and elegant, with her hair tussled on her forehead, Madame Marie Iou began. Ladies and gentlemen, citizens, comrades, there are two kinds of truths, those that are widespread and those that are carefully hidden in the depths of people's consciousness. I will only address the latter. I am therefore not going to sing a romance to the crowd. I have already had trouble finding a venue. I have been refused by two of them on the grounds that I am not respectful enough for scholars. The fact is that I have a talent, which is not ordinary, for turning everyone against me. The article continues. The audience laughed and applauded this preamble, and Madame Uyo recited with remarkable memory, without omitting a word, the lecture she had already published in a magazine in which she declared that we should no longer procreate. Interestingly, it says that the lecture had been published previously in a magazine, but I could not find this anywhere. I could only find the copy of Le Mal de Vivre in 1909. Anyway, funnily enough, the article also actually details a back and forth between Marie and some troublemakers in the audience. And in the article, they say that there are certain parts of the back and forth they couldn't reproduce in the article out of decency. So I'm assuming it got a bit colourful. The students clamour and whistle. Go and fetch the security guard, cried Mrs. Uyo. The speaker's friends tell her that the policeman doesn't want to come. The police, said Mrs. Uyo, are leaving me at your mercy. I'm sure you'll have the cowardice to take advantage of it. And you can see why there was so much uproar. In an article in La Silhouette, it was reported that it is her love of animals that undoubtedly led her to hate humanity. A hatred that goes so far as to call for the abolition of man. 
According to her, those who have children are criminals because he who gives life gives death. Her advice is abstain. Then when it came to the end of the lecture, the Latemp article explains that the floor opened up for people to come up and oppose her view. Reportedly, several people got up on stage one after another to express their disagreement. As the article explains, two were socialists, one was an anti-Semite, and another was a student. And once the lecture ended, Marie was even followed home by some students chanting boo, Malthus, boo. And then a few weeks after the lecture, an interview with Marie was published. This was an interview with Jacques Mao in La Science Francais. In it, he lays out why he wanted to obtain the interview. In the midst of the uproar which greeted her first words and which continued until the end of the lecture, it was difficult to follow the speaker, so I asked Marie Iou to grant me an interview. He goes on to say, She pursues the goal of the Scotsi, who are working for the annihilation of the human race, because she thinks that life is bad, and her utopia would be to arrive at nothingness. Nothingness is the perfect state. As for the instincts for self-preservation, it is a natural instinct, but bad in itself since it encourages man and animals to preserve life, which is a web of pain, rather than fall back into nothingness, which is a desirable state because there is no suffering there. Another interesting thing in Jack's article is what he says were Marie's last words. I'm not a bad person, but if one day I had the means to blow up the whole universe and myself with it, well, that day I'd be a criminal. And I wonder if this is the first example way back in 1882 of someone saying that they will embrace the benevolent world exploder, which was first presented by Roger Ken Smart in 1958. Anyway, that's a bit of a summary of the media that surrounded Marie's lecture. I've I've put all the links you'll need in the description. I now want to talk a bit about the situation of Neo-Malthusianism in France post her lecture. In 1909, the same year that The Pain of Living was released, Conscious Generation also released a small booklet on Neo-Malthusianism called Le Neo-Malthusme et le Moral. The book contains short essays from different proponents of the idea. Marie Ayur was one of them. In her piece, she explains about how she thinks her lecture has kind of been forgotten, but then there have been other people who have taken up the mantle of carrying the message forward. But it is unclear as to whether she means Neo-Malthusianism generally or her specific antinatalist message. If she means specifically antinatalism, then one of those people she could have been talking about could have been Koenig, who I mentioned earlier, who released an antinatalist pamphlet in French in 1897. As the years went on, Neo-Malthusianism actually started to gain some more significant influence in France, and countermeasures were put in place by the government to legislate against the expression of Neo-Malthusian views, claiming it to be an affront to public decency. Interestingly, in a newspaper, Le Parisien, after Marie's lecture, the author of the article explains that there actually was already a trend of people not having children. Now, how much of this resulted from Neo-Malthusianism, I'm not sure. I have to note that Madame Ouyeur preached to the choir. Her lecture was useless. Today, people don't have children anymore because women are tired from their jobs. Most children are due to an accident. We now count on only accidents to perpetuate our race, and little on the need to love this inevitable necessity. Again, in Impeding the Birth Control Movement, Theories and Activities in France and the United States by Fatima Ramdani, Fatima Ramdani explains that the French government were banning all sorts of anti-contraception propaganda, and quotes a letter written by Eugene Humber, a leading figure in the movement from 1925. I was harshly condemned to prison and fined for having taught the poor the practices of procreative prudence, employed by by the cultivated and well-to-do classes, crushed by a class judgment without precedent, victim of the reigning hypocrisy, I had the pain of seeing all our redemptive action stifled by the blind reaction of our ruling bourgeois. And in 1911, many Neo-Malthusians, including Marie, wrote a letter to a senator asking for safeguards for the freedom of thought and expression of the press without the imposition of restrictions, but that come with a thinly veiled justification of good morals. So I think that gives a good overview overview of Marie's antinatalist views and the climate that she existed within. I now want to talk a bit about another topic that she was actually more known for, which is animal rights. Marie Yu was an outspoken animal rights activist. She founded the Popular League Against Vivisection, and she also founded France's first animal hospice. She was a socialist and keen to make a concern for animals a key part of fighting against social injustice. She lays out her case for this in the article Le droit des animaux, which is in English, the rights of animals. In issue 31 of 
of Les Revue Socialistes. Here are some passages from that article. Animals are simply considered as property and not as individuals or sentient beings. It is impossible, even for mocking minds, skeptics, and especially our adversaries, not to take into consideration the following examination of conscience, which I submit to the reflections of all impartial judges. It is because my flesh has bled, because my heart has been crushed, because I have known misery and humiliation, and because I have felt selfishness, cowardice, and all the instincts of animality stirring inside me, that I lean toward the torn, groaning, repulsive, and despised beast, enslaved by both the brutalities of man and the fatalities of nature. As for us, it is because society offers some guarantees to our fellow human beings that we have chosen the thankless task of safeguarding animals. It is also in order to widen the circle of empathy beyond the human species that we ask for these mute beings, our companions, our servants, our toys or our prey, a little of that fairness and a little of that love which are the glory of man, for we owe pity to all. We must, to the extent of our strength and social necessity, sympathise with all suffering, relieve all victims of nature, animal brutality or human wickedness. She also took direct action to protect animals and promote their moral concern, something that made her a very controversial figure. Christoph Trini explains in their book, The Animal Rights Struggle, an essay on historical sociology, that animal advocacy at the time was generally the preserve of very respectable animal protectionists in the social elite, but Marie Eu and others introduced novel shock tactics to animal rights activism. On the 22nd of May, 1883, Marie interrupted a lecture by Charles E. brown Sicard who was dissecting a monkey without anaesthetic. As news articles from the Time report, Marie stood up and applied a very energetic umbrella stroke to the nose of the esteemed Mr. Brown Saccard. And then in 1886, she similarly disrupted a lecture by Louis Pestin at Sorbonne University for using dogs and rabbits to try and find a cure for rabies. She also campaigned against bullfighting. On one occasion on the 4th of June 1900, she accompanied a Swedish friend of hers to a protest against bullfighting, where he proceeded to shoot two of the matadors, who are the men who torment the bulls. She's also published reflections on a previous occasion where she protested bullfighting as well. On the 19th of January 1887, passing from words to action, I went with about 20 of my friends to the race course, where the first bullfight was taking place. Our pockets stuffed with high-pitched whistles, we took several spare whistles each because we knew that people would grab them from us. Determined to stand up to anyone and anything come hell or high water, we split up into groups of two or three and spread out intending to take it in turns to create a disturbance. When one group was removed, another group would take over and so on, until the end of the performance which we aimed not to just disrupt, but to actually prevent from taking place. As soon as we blew our whistles, all the bullfighting fans jumped on us, and on the terraces 10 metres above the course, a hilarious scene ensued. My nose was bleeding almost as much as the balls. Because they could not be removed in any other way, the protesters were thrown over the seats, they received kicks in the face, and their clothes were left in tatters. Of course, through engaging in such controversial actions, Marie accrued some enemies. It's said that gangs of medical students used to to turn up to her anti-vivisection lectures and make animal noises to mock her. It seems like bay controls have some historical precedent. In a Latemp article from the 15th of April 1890, the sort of audience that Marie would attract is described. From her very first words, Mrs. Yu, who regrets not having been able to shout from the top of the Eiffel Tower that animals are our brothers, is violently interrupted. With difficulty, amidst the constant noise, Mrs. Yu continued her lecture. Even more controversially, Marie took a pro mortem position to population control when it concerned animals, saying that they were better off dead than living the lives that they would amongst humans. In Le Mal de Veuve, she expresses her pro mortalist position on animals. And yet, it is quite simple to wait for the female cat to trap her when she is about to give birth, and then, for the sake of reason and compassion, take the newborns and one by one as they emerge from her hips and in the hand tightly clasp them by the neck and plunge them into a bucket of water with a heavy lid so that they cannot resurface and die immediately without ever having lived. The newspaper Le Public even claimed that she said this, little dogs, little cats and little children should be thrown into the Seine. However, this was later retracted because she sent in a complaint letter to the newspaper on the 5th of October 1892. I won't read the whole letter but here 
here's an abbreviated version. Sir, in the report published on the subject of my lecture last Sunday on Malthusianism, I note, among other errors, this one which is impossible for me to allow to pass uncorrected, despite all my resignation and disdain. Here is your text. When by misfortune I have little dogs or cats, I put a stone around their necks and throw them into the Seine. We should do the same with children. I appeal to all those who have heard me. I have never preached infanticide or used such idiotic language. I am all the more astonished to have to protest against such misrepresentations, given that I gave the text of my conference to all journalists in charge of reporting it so as to avoid the errors and nonsense that the professional good faith of these agents of public opinion so often attribute to me. As the sentence in your newspaper, which I have just mentioned, is likely to lead to legal proceedings against me, I am counting on your loyalty to insert this correction. Yours faithfully, Marie Eul. This is really interesting because it shows that she was thoughtful enough to print out the speech to give to journalists, but also that it was pretty common for her to get misrepresented in the media. And this is obviously something we need to take into account account when we're reading back these media reports about her and even the things that I've said in this video. Regardless, Marie did seem to have at least killed cats and dogs, and we should recognise that she did some unethical things in her time. When looking back at people in history, you cannot help but recognise the interesting and noble things they did and pass it from the things that we view as unethical and should condemn. So I hope you found that dive into Marie Eu interesting. I'm sure that's not everything about her antinatalist views and her views on animals that are out there, so so if you find anything else, please include it in the comments. I know that there were even some resources that I was not able to access for researching this video. So if you know anything more about Marie Yu or her promotion of antinatalism or any other interesting information about her, please put it in the comments. She's definitely a controversial figure, but also a very intriguing one. And she was impactful both in her time, but also in the current day. So let me know what you thought of her in the comments below. Let me know if there are any other figures in history regarding antinatalism that you think should be looked into and I'll see you in the next one.